So, hello, everybody. It's great to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us in this space for the stream webinar series. Uh, we'll just get started here quickly. We'll wait for everyone to, to come into the space. So my name is Reagan Mallinson and I'm a biologist and program manager for Living Lakes Canada. And I'm joining you from Whistler, BC on the shared unceded territory of the Squamish Nation and the Lilwat Nation. So please let us know where you're joining from today in the chat box. And we'll get started soon. So please take a minute to enter your comments and introduce yourself. <clears throat> so before we get started, uh, please note that there will be time for a question and answer session at the end. Um, so also take a minute to locate the question and answer function in your uh, Zoom controls. As we move through the presentations, if you have any questions, please enter them in here um, and we'll, we'll get to them at the end for the Q&A session. Um, so we'll also be recording this session and this recording will be distributed uh, along with presenters slides and any resource documents that come out through the presentation um, that will be sent in a follow up package early next week. Um, and the webinar recording can also be found on the Living Lakes Canada website and YouTube channel. So this is our third webinar in the stream webinar series hosted by Living Lakes Canada. And so Living Lakes Canada is a national nonprofit net organization, and we are working towards the long-term protection of Canada's fresh water. So our mission is to normalize water stewardship through the protection of Canada's fresh water. And we believe that um, community-based water monitoring is a way to localize climate adaptation and provide support for decision-making to help fill important data gaps. And so much of our work has become a grassroots template for aquatic ecosystem monitoring across BC and Canada. And we are also affiliated with an international organization called Living Lakes International, which is a network of over 120 non-government organizations that share the same mandate as us to protect rivers, wetlands, lakes, and watersheds around the world. Um, so you can see here that we have another, a number of other projects on the go. So if you're interested in our other projects, please check out our website here. So this is our third of four webinar series, and you can see the date and the time for our final webinar on May 27th on the screen here. Um, and we've had a great roster of speakers who have joined us over the last couple months to talk about the stream project, the cabin methods, benthic macro and vertebrates. And we have still a great number of speakers coming up to talk about how they've implemented the stream project in their own home watersheds. Um, and develop their own monitoring programs through the stream project. And so the goal of this series is to provide viewers with an overview of stream, of the stream project, what we have achieved to date, um, and provide examples of how the stream project has been applied um, with our fabulous community-based monitors, such as the ones that we'll be speaking today, um, to really make this project what it is. So if you or any of the viewers are interested in getting involved in this stream project, please reach out to us. And so today's webinar explores how the stream project has been applied at the community level using the methods we've covered in the last two webinars. So to share a bit about their monitoring programs, we have Kaylee McCallum with the Elk River Alliance in British Columbia, Sophie Forstrom with the Old Men Watershed Council, and Charlene Fritz with the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society, both in Alberta. So, so Kaylee's up first, and Kaylee McCallum is the Elk River Alliance newest member, having taken on the role of junior ecologist in early March. So although new to the Elk River Alliance, she has spent a number of years working on a variety of environmental and conservation programs across Canada um, before she settled into the Elk Valley. She is passionate about understanding local environmental issues and collaborating with communities and industry in order to encourage a more widespread knowledge of our natural river systems and preserve them for future generations. So I'll pass it off to you, Kaylee. Okay. 
Perfect. Awesome. Okay, well, hello everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I'm joining you from Bernie, British Columbia in the traditional territory of the Tanaha Nation. Um, my name is Kaylee and uh, like Regan already said, I'm the new junior ecologist for the Elk River Watershed Alliance. Um, and today I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our organization and our experiences so far working with both cabin and stream programs. Awesome. So. Uh, uh, the Elk River Alliance, or ERA, was formed in 2010 with the goal of increasing local knowledge and participation in watershed government, or sorry, governance. Um, our mission is to use science, education, and community collaboration to ensure a sustainable stewardship of our watershed. Uh, one of our biggest uh, ongoing programs is our community-based water monitoring, um, but we also have a number of other projects on the go. Um, we're currently doing some stuff with sedimentation, um, installing some hydrometric stations, restoration, um, and we're working on a monitoring collaborative program. Uh, so our organization is located in Fernie, um, but our work covers the entirety of the Elk Valley. Um, and this area has a long history of industrialization and is home to a number of mining, logging, linear, and residential developments. Uh, the first coal mine uh, was established here in the late 1800s, um, which brought with it numerous other developments to support it. Uh, and currently uh, in the valley, we have four active steelmaking coal mines um, with two more as well as an extension in the works. Um, we also have extensive logging operations. Um, that picture there is from the 2018 Elk Valley Cumulative Effects Assessment and Management Report, uh, and it shows the footprint left by anthropogenic land use, uh, not including cut blocks, um, between the 1950s and 2015. So it's looking at roads, mines, urban centers, industrial features, power lines. Um, and according to this document, uh, the Elk Valley has seen an 177% increase in the total human footprint since the 1950s. Um, and then to give you an idea of how much uh, space our cut blocks on top of that would cover, uh, the document suggested that the total human footprint without including uh, like cut blocks from logging was about 260 kilometers squared. Um, but as soon as you include those uh, cut blocks, it's 530. Um, so in the Elk Valley, about 30% of the land is privately owned. Um, and one eighth of the land is privately owned by a single company, um, a single logging company. Uh, so there have been dramatic increases in private logging, um, which don't necessarily conform to the rules of Crown land. Awesome. So both industry and uh, government already conduct a lot of water monitoring throughout the valley. Uh, so we see it as our role to fill in gaps in the data collected by these entities. Uh, so our goal with community-based water monitoring is to look at areas of public concern and include the community in monitoring and decision making. Um, since the Elk Valley already has such a long-standing relationship with mining, uh, there's a lot being done already on mining affected areas of the watershed. So we tend to focus our data collection on non-mining affected tributaries of the Elk River. So currently we look at 10 sites along five different tribs. Uh, our sites were chosen because they're areas of either community concern or contain a good habitat that we'd either like to monitor, preserve, or restore. Uh, so we currently look at Coal Creek, Lizard Creek, Alexander, Boyvin, and Morrissey. Um, and we're doing cabin at all of those locations, uh, but are looking at stream uh, just in the lower or the downstream locations. Um, so we've been using cabin protocols as part of our CBWM monitoring since 2012 um, to identify Elk River tributaries impacted by land use activities and inform restoration efforts. Uh, initially, we were using a combination of cabin and stream keepers uh, for our water monitoring, but in 2019, we transitioned into using cabin exclusively. Um, so this uh, using cabin has uh, made our data collection process much more standardized and streamlined. Um, and since CABIN is a, nas a national program, it's also made it easier to compare our data across different areas. Um, one of our biggest goals uh, at the Elk River Alliance is to make our data more comparable to that collected by other organizations and industry um, to hopefully allow for better data sharing in future. Um, another bonus of uh, using CABIN is uh, how easy uh, it is to display results 
Um, so this little community ellipses or bullseye um, is great because it's simplified for a wider audience, um, which is awesome in terms of community-based or water monitoring because uh, it makes our results a little more accessible. So uh, obviously one of the most exciting aspects of using uh, the CABIN program over more traditional water monitoring uh, is the inclusion of benthic macroinvertebrates as an indication of stream health. Uh, so using the stream program uh, takes things one step further and looks at these invertebrates at a finer taxonomic resolution, uh, which means that it has the potential to monitor for things that are maybe more like species specific. Um, our organizing, or, or, sorry, our organization uh, is particularly interested in the idea of using these methods to assess for potential whirling disease outbreaks. Um, although there are currently no documented cases of it in BC, it's been found at several locations in Alberta, um, particularly near the BC border. Um, and since the parasite that causes whirling disease relies on a specific sludge worm as a host, uh, testing for the presence of that sludge worm is a great first step for us to see if there's even the potential for spread here. Um, so if you take a look at this lovely map from the government of Alberta, uh, you can see how close our area, so the whole Sparwood, Fernie, Elkford um, area is to some of the real hot spots uh, for whirling disease um, just across our border. Um, we were able to chat with uh, Chloe and Regan about this, um, and Chloe was really amazing and personalized our stream results to include a small section on whirling disease host detection. Um, and according to our results, the host was only found at one of our locations, which may indicate uh, what sites to look at in terms of a potential outbreak, but also tells us that further investigation is probably needed to examine the full extent of this. And the fact that we found it at one site uh, means that it's probably uh, elsewhere as well uh, and just wasn't captured during this round of sampling. Um, another one of the big benefits uh, for us of trialing the stream program is the extra support that our organization has received. Um, last year, our staff received infield cabin and stream training through Living Lakes Canada. Um, and even after that, both Living Lakes and those involved in the stream program have made themselves available to us for extra assistance. Um, particularly for me, being a new member of a community watershed group, I really appreciate uh, both Regan and Chloe specifically making time to chat with me about any questions I've had about either program. Awesome. Uh, so for us, uh, the major benefit of adopting programs like Cabin and Stream is bringing our data up to a level where it can be uh, compared to what's being collected by industry and other sources. Uh, so obviously in a valley like this, uh, keeping things pristine uh, isn't an option so because industry is so much a part of the communities in the area. Um, so we recognize the need to work with community groups and industry to collaborate and find ways to work towards creating healthy, sustainable ecosystems and communities. Um, so this is why we've begun to explore the idea of working with industry um, to create a monitoring collaborative. Uh, we're hoping to launch this program later this year, um, and we're currently just talking to potential partners uh, about creating data sharing agreements, uh, which would unlock a lot of data that would be otherwise unavailable to us. Um, and the idea for us is to create or to build good relationships with industry and allow the community to have a better understanding of watershed issues and weigh in on local water, water decision making. Um, cabin protocols are really great in terms of getting our data to a place where it could be compared and used by, um, by others. Uh, and as an extension of this uh, program, we're also currently in the process of adding our data to the Columbia Basin Water Hub. Um, and Santiago and Paige have been really great with helping us get started and find the best ways to upload and display our data on the Water Hub. Um, and we're just uh, really excited to have the opportunity to share our data on a wider scale across the basin. Um, yeah, and I just want to send a thank you to all our partners and funders for the CBWM program uh, and specifically mention that this program was uh, supported through the BC Gaming Grant as well as the Healthy Watersheds Initiative, uh, which is delivered by the Real Estate Foundation of BC and Watersheds BC uh, with financial support from the province of British Columbia. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for your presentation. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> we can send out more information about the Columbia Basin 
um, data hub and the follow-up package if participants are interested in learning about more information for um, that project. Uh, Santiago and Paige, who Kaylee mentioned, are also with Living Lakes Canada. So up next, we have Sophie Forstrom. And Sophie Forstrom is the Education Program Manager for the Old Men Watershed Council based out of Lethbridge. In addition to overseeing education projects like engaging recreationists and supervising summer staff, she also coordinates volunteer restoration events and is developing an aquatic biomonitoring program in the headwaters. Sophie has a master's degree in applied ecology and before joining the Old Men Watershed Council, she worked as a science educator at the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta. In her spare time, she volunteers as a scout leader, rides her horse, and goes hiking with her dog, Keish. So take it away, Sophie. Thanks, Reagan. Can everybody see in here okay? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Well, good morning, everyone. I guess after, good afternoon for those who may be in the eastern side of the country. Um, yeah, my presentation today is just going to cover a little bit about how the Old Man Watershed Council is using the cabin protocols and the stream program to monitor some of our stewardship activities. And then I'll also mention and discuss a little bit about a broader collaborative of watershed stewardship groups, First Nations and other agencies that are all working together to support each other and develop local aquatic monitoring programs. So to get started, just a little bit about us. The Old Man Watershed Council is a stakeholder-led nonprofit, and we are based in Lethbridge, Alberta. We are one of 11 watershed planning and advisory councils that were formed under Alberta's Water for Life strategy. The Old Man Watershed Council works on Treaty 7 land, this is the ancestral and traditional territory of the original watershed stewards, the Blackfoot Confederacy, that includes the Kainai, Pikani, and Siksika, as well as the Tsutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations. And we are so honored to partner with and learn from them. Now, you may or may not know, but everybody lives in a watershed. And I invite you all to type the name of your own local watershed into the chat. And uh, if you aren't sure, I'm gonna share a link right now to um, a website where you can find out the name of your local watershed. And if you're in Alberta, bonus points if you also know the name of your watershed planning and advisory council. So go ahead and type that into the chat. Uh, here in the Old Man Watershed Council, we're working in the Old Man Watershed, which stretches from High River along the eastern slopes of the Rockies to just east of Tabor, uh, where the Old Man and the Bow River uh, combine to form the South Saskatchewan River, and then eventually the water makes its way through Saskatchewan and Manitoba to the Hudson Bay. It all begins, though, here in the headwaters, and We've been doing a lot of work in our headwaters with volunteers and partners like Cows and Fish and Trout Unlimited, as well as the Blackfoot Confederacy and local recreation groups to restore stream banks by planting willow stakes. So this is a process known as bioengineering because you're using living things to engineer the stream banks. And these willow planting events are grant funded and they rely on partnerships and volunteers. These volunteers include college students, recreationists, scout groups, families, government, different agencies. And the grants that we receive to do this work are usually kind of earmarked for improving habitat for aquatic species at risk, like native trout, West Slope cutthroat trout, bull trout, et cetera. And for these events, we partner with groups like Cows and Fish and Cows and Fish do riparian assessments we're restoring riparian areas, it makes sense. But we were missing the aquatic component of doing some monitoring and seeing you know, what kind of impact we were having. And so we thought we should maybe start doing that. Now, 
I do not have any kind of background in aquatic ecology. Uh, my own master's research was on a semi-arid rangeland, so far from water. But I did hear about this cabin protocol and stream program from other WPAC educators. And last summer, uh, as everyone was probably affected, we were also affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it changed our work plans a little bit, but it did give me time to organize and start this aquatic monitoring program. And so we were able to collect baseline data at seven, or seven sites last fall in 2020, and six of those were sent to the University of Guelph for DNA metabarcoding. And our hope is that these aquatic um, samples will complement the riparian data that we have collected. And then our plan is to then assess the change in time and hopefully that change is an improvement in the aquatic ecosystem. So here are some photos from last field season and training session uh, across our headwaters and the photo in the bottom in the middle, that is our very first ever stream sample that we collected. We are very proud and very pleased with ourselves. And the top left is a training session that was uh, conducted by Living Lakes Canada. That's Reagan looking through the uh, viewfinder there. All right, so when we're collecting this data, we're getting um, habitat data, we're trying to characterize the habitat that these benthic macroinvertebrates are living in, and we're also collecting water chemistry data or water samples to send to a lab. And that was the first, uh, those were the first results that we got back. And so we are able to characterize the water chemistry of these streams and compare it to Alberta's surface water quality guidelines for the protection of freshwater aquatic life. And so we can see our, our six sites from last fall, you know, our pH fall within the guideline, our dissolved oxygen levels um, for the most part are above the minimum levels for aquatic life. There were a couple of parameters that were near or above their guidelines. So those might indicate that we might wanna take another look or just keep an eye on those sites in particular. And uh, we just received our stream and our cabin taxonomist reports, and I'm still reading through them, but based on just a very preliminary read through, I uh, made some colorful figures to share with you today, because who doesn't like colorful figures? Uh, so this first one is looking at the species richness of our six sites, and the large orange dot is the average for each stream site. Um, the smaller orange dots are the replicates collected at each site. And then the blue horizontal line is the cabin taxonomist species richness that was calculated. So they were, you know, fairly similar, a couple of differences. And then um, looking at what different groups of organisms make up these different, all the species richness, we can see that here, each column represents the number of genera present at each site. And in gray, it's just various genera present in each order, but the colored ones are organized a little bit differently. Those are the bioindicators, the caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies, and they are not grouped by, um, by Genus, they are grouped by tolerance level. So their tolerance to pollution with a least tolerant at the bottom in bright green going up to less tolerant. And the tolerance level is out of 10 in total. Uh, so those are our bio indicators. They're indicating that the water quality is pretty good. And then in red, I just pulled out that tube effects worm that uh, Kaylee was mentioning. That's the host for the whirling disease and it infects the Samonid fish. And following the example actually from the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society, we had asked them to be highlighted in our report. 
So Beaver Creek, our first column there, is already in the red zone for whirling disease, meaning that it's already tested positive. We know whirling disease is there. Uh, but the other site on Dutch Creek is in the yellow zone for whirling disease. And that means it's at high risk for the introduction or spread of whirling disease due to the presence of susceptible species, so our, our fish species, as well as the high use of the area and access to water. So that's definitely a site for us to keep an eye on. Very preliminary results so far, but we're hoping to delve into it a little bit more as I find the time. All right, next, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about this collaborative that we are working with across the Eastern Slopes. Um, it was spurred by the stream training program or session that was offered by Living Lakes Canada in Canmore in July of 2019. And I attended that and met Reagan as well as folks from the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society. And following that, we have had numerous conference calls and emails and meetings uh, with 40 plus individuals from 20 organizations across Alberta. And this includes watershed planning and advisory councils, First Nations, watershed stewardship groups, government agencies, uh, researchers, et cetera, from across the province. And I apologize if I've missed anybody on here because it seems that every day we're adding more and more people, which is great. The momentum is building and that's wonderful. And what we're doing right now is really just promoting the use of cabin and stream as the protocols to be used in the province for stream monitoring. And we are um, in our meetings, you know, we're sharing our resources and our knowledge. We're building capacity, seeking funding, advising each other on the logistics and where to find equipment. And we're also working together to hopefully develop a reference model for the eastern slopes of Alberta that we will all be able to use. And then we will also be able to hopefully get those beautiful bullseye graphics that Kaylee shared. Our fingers are crossed, we're working on it. I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail as to why we want to do community-based monitoring. This has been covered in other webinars, I think, but overall, just briefly, um, doing the monitoring as a community-based activity can complement government or academic research and monitoring. Because it's driven by local community needs and values, it tends to be more nimble and flexible uh, because it's coordinated by smaller organizations. So there's a little bit less red tape and hoops to jump through. And we're also able to make the data accessible to the community in a more timely fashion as a result. It's also just a fantastic experiential learning activity and provides really valuable skills training. And not only that, but it also helps to engage and motivate lo local citizens. There's nothing like spending a wonderful sunny day for us in our case in the mountains in a stream outside, you know, to really connect with nature. And, and so it's a, a good, um, how to say, you know, it's good for, good for your well-being as well, your health and your wellness. Um, this has also been covered by other presenters as well, but why, why we chose to use Cabin and contribute to the stream uh, project itself. Um, rather than just measuring environmental parameters like flow and water chemistry, what we really liked about it is that it's involving the biological monitoring of cumulative effects. And it really makes sense. There's no need for all of these 20 organizations to start from scratch and come up with their own system. It would, it's really handy to have a standardized protocol across the country that we are able to use. There's already training an online database, analysis tools, that's all already developed. So that's fantastic and it's cost effective as well. And the neat thing is it's applicable to lots of different situations. So we have all of these 20 organizations across Alberta and they're all working on their own local study questions. Things like the impacts of anthropogenic land uses on water quality and watershed health 
uh, monitoring improvements after restoration and implementation of beneficial management practices, like what we're doing. Um, looking at cold water fish habitat and sediment issues, wildfire impacts, cumulative effects, and just filling in those knowledge gaps about source water quality and aquatic ecosystem health to inform local watershed planning. These are all really valuable uh, projects and the cabin and the stream program are helping us to achieve those. So currently our collaborative that's working across the Eastern slopes is uh, seeking funding, putting together equipment lists, you know, figuring out our study questions and our sampling sites. And some groups have already started sampling and some are still in that building capacity and planning stage. So we're gonna continue to network and make connections with partners and potential funders. And I believe Living Lakes Canada is hoping to assist us by providing a little bit of training this summer in Alberta, depending of course on, on the COVID restrictions at the time. So I think what's really exciting is that momentum is building. We're getting more and more people joining us with each meeting. And we're really hoping that this is something that's going to um, become something really big and the way to move forward with, with monitoring uh, in Alberta. With that, I want to just give a huge thank you to our funders and our supporters. Some of the funders that have demonstrated support for the Old Man Watershed Council's aquatic monitoring program includes Bray Lake Sawmills, the Shell Foothills Legacy Fund, Alberta Conservation Association's Conservation Community and Education Grant, Alberta Ecotrust, and the Government of Alberta. And I particularly want to thank Reagan and Living Lakes Canada for your expertise and training and all of the support that you've provided. Um, thank you for answering all of my novice questions and for helping us to get this collaborative flowing across Alberta's eastern slopes, as well as the World Wildlife Fund and University of Guelph for providing the, the DNA metabarcoding and the, the funding for that. I also just wanted to give a little special shout out to Shannon and Callie. Those are our executive director and office manager, respectively. Um, Callie's actually a chartered accountant. And I don't believe when she joined our organization that she expected to be traipsing through the field and the streams with me, but she has gamely done so. And I greatly appreciate it and Shannon as well. So thank you both. And with that, I will just conclude by saying, feel free to contact me with any questions you might have about our project, or if you have ways you would like to contribute. You can check out our website for more information about the Old Man Watershed Council and what we do. I will just note that the our cabin and stream monitoring are not on our website yet, um, but watch that space. We're hoping to get it up there soon. Thanks so much everyone for your time. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we're really excited to see your program develop and uh, progress over the, uh, the next few years and um, really excited to be working together on that reference model development with the Eastern Slopes Collaborative. Um, so up next, we have Charlene Fritz with the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society. Um, and as the education coordinator, Charlene leads and collaborates on watershed education initiatives with K-12 post-secondary students and adult audiences. And in her previous role, she was a high school science teacher with the Rocky View School Division. Charlene is endlessly fascinated with the intersection of people and nature, especially in the ghost watershed. Um, no wonder, because look how beautiful it is. She volunteered on the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society stream and cabin monitoring fieldwork last summer and produced an excellent video of the process. Um, and we'll definitely be sharing that video in the follow-up package. So stay tuned for that. So take it away, Charlene. Thank you, Reagan, and welcome to everyone here. Um, my name is Charlene Fritz and I'm with the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society. It was um, Cal Hill, our president, who was to be here, but um, I'm here instead and, and pleased to talk about the excellent experience that we've had so far. 
So this presentation today uh, really continues on with the flow of the previous two presenters and much of what they've described, we will um, talk about here again. And um, this presentation probably should start with just describing who we are. And as Sophie mentioned, uh, in um, 2002, the Alberta government put together the Alberta Water for Life strategy. And under that strategy, there were 11 water po um, policy and advisory committees, um, councils rather, that were established. And one of those was the Old Man Watershed Council. The other was the Bow River Basin Council. And under those are watershed stewardship groups, which are smaller local community-based organizations. And that's where the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society was born under that, that mandate. And we are truly a, a strong partner in water management in Alberta. So we are volunteer run, community based, and we look for um, this vision. And under this vision statement of, of being a biologically rich headwaters, we have four strategic objectives. And one of those is conducting science and research. Another is providing advice and recommendations to decision makers. A third is ecological restoration, uh, particularly for aquatic habitat. And the fourth one is education and outreach. And that's um, the role that I've been in in the last year and a half. So where are we? And this map just shows the, the footprint of the watershed. So we are a source water area for the city of Calgary. And just to orient you, if you can see the, the pointer here, this is Banff. And this is Cochrane, and the Bow Corridor kind of traces its way through here. Uh, at the Ghost Reservoir, there's a hydroelectric um, facility run by Transalta, and this is where the Ghost River, the main stem, enters the Bow River. So that is the outlet of the watershed, and you can see that the beginnings and the headwaters of the watershed are really the front ranges of the Rocky Mountains, and our back door is Banff National Park, and these high elevation peaks um, descend about 2,000 meters from the upper western edge down to its eastern outlet. And through the course of, of the drainage, it goes through alpine, subalpine, montane, and foothills landscapes. So the Highway 40 is the main um, artery, transportation artery through the watershed. A lot of it is hard to access. Some of these uh, tributaries have been difficult, especially when I start talking about where we were sampling. Some, some times it's a challenge to actually get to these sites. But this just gives you a sense. And also just to point out from this slide that about 78% of the land in the Ghost Watershed is Crown land. So that means that it falls under the jurisdiction of the government of Alberta. And there are multiple land uses with throughout the watershed. Um, before I leave this, just to give you a sense of the size, it's about 950 square kilometers in area, and it provides about 7% of the flow upstream of Calgary into the Bow River. And because it is so close to Calgary, we are noticing and have noticed for quite some time that the smaller surrounding communities and the multi-use nature of the area, it creates more pressure uh, which has the potential to negatively impact the health of the watershed. And before I leave this, I also wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge our, the First Nations and Indigenous people of this, of this area, of Southern Alberta. So we have, um, in Southern Alberta, the Indigenous people we'd like to acknowledge are the Treaty 7 region, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Kakani, and Kainai First Nations the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which include the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and the Wesley First Nations, as well as the Métis Nation number of Alberta, sorry, Region 3. And um, we are just, as, as Reagan mentioned at the beginning, some of the photos that you're about to see of where we have been able to operate um, in our water monitoring are just sort of, they're stunning landscapes. And, and as Sophie described, just being in these landscapes uh, contributes to your own personal wellness. But just to come back to why we started to be part of the cabin and stream protocols. In 2018, following the guidelines developed by the province of Alberta, we produced a state of the watershed report. 
And that was a culmination of years of work, um, some from ourselves, some from consul a consultant. And it resulted in 32 recommendations. And so the recommendations ranged a variety of topics, including riparian health, biodiversity. But one of the main recommendations regarding surface water quality was to perform aquatic invertebrate sampling using the CABIN protocol. So overall, the conclusion from the State of the Watershed report was that the water quality is actually quite good. The primary area for concern was high sediment influx into the Waypress Creek, which is a major tributary to the Ghost River, during and immediately after rainfall events. And decades ago, turbid waters typically occurred only in the late spring, during the spring runoff, but increasing anthrop anthropogenic activity in the area and the extensive network of linear features, such as logging roads, old seismic lines, and OHV trails, appear to be contributing to the problem. And we're now seeing these the turbidity throughout, uh, throughout the year, not just in the spring runoff. So this is an example you can see once the soil has been decompacted and the vegetation is stripped. Uh, this is an old seismic line. You can see the, the contribution of the sediment into Wapress Creek. A couple other examples you can see in these photos, uh, same thing, a seismic line turned into an OHV trail. And this image on the right hand is from a, a logging cut block. These are a series of photos that, that Cal took. And he was hiking along this small stream, which is a Westlip cutthroat trout bearing stream. And he noticed as uh, he was walk walking through here, a couple of ATVs were riding adjacent to this stream and did not cross the stream, but simply uh, splashed through a puddle and that water came into the stream. And you can see over the five minute interval, how the water quickly changes from relatively clean. You can see the, the tannins and the, the, um, the stones below. And all of a sudden, in five minutes, you've got this cloudy, turbid water. And so it just it illustrates just how quickly and sensitive these, these streams are. And we know, of course, that the sediment is a problem for native trout in two ways. One, that it affects the aquatic invertebrates, as well as it makes it more difficult for spawning and for the uh, female to create her red, her spawning nest. So what did we do? Um, we created a water monitoring program. And in this program, it went through many draft versions. It was basically a multi-year strategy for stamp sampling our watershed. And uh, it was to test sites to obtain a picture I use benthic invertebrates as uh, key species of uh, indicators of water quality. And we're to test over multiple years to detect the trajectory and the dynamics of these key indicator species. To identify possible sources of watershed impacts, to identify key sediment sources that could negatively impact the health of these benthic uh, macroinvertebrates, and to monitor the effectiveness of restoration work on stream health. Now, just as Sophie mentioned, uh, the Ghost Watershed also does bioengineering. And, and in our programming, we typically do one bioengineering event per year. So we have a workshop uh, in a full day presentation, usually by Dave Polster, who is um, a bioengineering specialist. And he teaches uh, for a full day. It's, it's a fantastic workshop. And then the, the following day is a field day where we go out and, and just as Sophie had described, uh, use native plant materials, willow staking, for example, to engineer the banks, to stabilize them, to prevent um, that sediment from flowing down into the water. So the stream cabin really will help us to pinpoint where this restoration work uh, will be most uh, successful. Again, some more reasons about why we chose to use the stream and cabin protocols. Uh, benthic invertebrates are indicators of stream health, and it was an important state of the watershed recommendation. More importantly, also, I think we just recognized that um, the Stream Cabinet Initiative provided a huge opportunity for the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society. It gave us a way to tackle the state of the watershed recommendations in a way that we simply didn't have the knowledge, guidance, or capacity to undertake on our own. And so, um, we just recognized that huge opportunity and again want to echo the thank you to the um, the ladies 
and and the men that are part of, of Living Lakes Canada, the World Wildlife Fund and the University of Guelph that, that make this possible. So again, just as I wanna echo Sophie and Kaylee's uh, appreciation for this rigorous standard protocol, that it, it standardizes things for us. It keeps this consistent science-based measurement tools. Uh, it provides solid foundation, um, which we can design a comprehensive and systematic multi-year monitoring framework in the ghost watershed. And it allows us, as was also mentioned, to be part of a nationwide method and network that contributes knowledge on the health of Canada's rivers and streams. We also uh, just appreciated the training opportunity. And as Sophie mentioned, we participated, four volunteers participated in Canmore in 2019. Uh, we appreciate that as a grant funded uh, organization that the EDNA lab analysis and shipping costs were covered for three years. That really helped us. And the approachable, knowledgeable instructors were giving us assistance when, when questions popped up. So what did we end up doing? We are, we've just completed our first year in this multi-year program. And so in our first year, we were able to raise $17,000 in grant funding for equipment, supplies, and partial payment for, this, for the project manager. Uh, we were able to sample 10 sites in September and October of 2020. Eight were along the Wakers Creek. That was our focus, was the sub-basin of, of Wakers Creek, and two along the Ghost River. And at each of those sites, we took three stream samples and one cabin taxonomic sample. So those are the, the dots representing the rough locations of where we took those samples. And those samples were chosen based on confluences with tributaries. Um, and, and also attempting to, to create a reference site uh, to connect with, as Sophie mentioned, Eastern Slopes Collaborative in terms of, of creating a, a reference condition for the Eastern Slopes. So this was our reference site, and this, these two sites were above and below Johnson Creek, these two sites above and below Meadow Creek, these two sites near human activity and land use, and this one, our site at the Waypress just before it entered the Ghost River. We were also able to do two sites above and below La Swear Creek on the Ghost River. And we were able to do that and wanted to do that as one of the major events in our watershed this past year was a wildfire. And so started by an abandoned campfire, it burned about 2,400 hectares. And so we wanted to get a bit of a baseline um, before some of those impacts on water quality potentially could be detected. So in stream and cabin, what did we do? We were submitting our samples to our cabin samples, the taxonomic samples to a lab in BC. And we've received those and um, our project manager is putting together a report as we speak. Um, and our stream samples went to the University of Guelph for the DNA meta barcoding analysis. And we've been participating in the Eastern Slopes Collaborative with all of the groups that Sophie mentioned. So what comes next? So we are already in the planning stages for our monitoring this coming fall, late August, early September. And the sites have been chosen. Uh, our objective this year is to focus more on the Ghost River, but we will return to three sites on the Waypress Creek in light of the fire. The headwaters of Johnson Creek were burned. And so we want, because we had sampled that yet last year ahead of the fire, we want to sample again uh, and see if there's any any change and if we can detect that change in the aquatic invertebrate communities. Um, and we want to train more volunteers if that's possible. And we'll, we'll, we will continue to participate in the stream and cabin Eastern Slopes Collaborative. We are in the process also of receiving funding for the field season and to date have received a, a majority of that funding. So we're, we're pleased, but we're still sort of um, calculating what that would look like for the fall. And as I said, also, we are in the process of looking at the results from last year. This was our first field season and very successful in the fact that we accomplished 10 sites. But um, now the data is coming in and our project managers putting together a report. 
So for more information, we, our website uh, contains our state of the watershed report, which is a compilation of all known data in the watershed on a variety of topics. So if you're interested in the watershed itself, that's a great place to go. Um, and we will be doing a viewing of the film beneath the surface, water monitoring in the ghost watershed. You could also view it on, on YouTube at your own, um, at, your, at your leisure. The video itself, if you wanted to come on May 6th, I can send you an Eventbrite link for registration and um, we'll have a panel discussion with the cabin team. And you can also contact me at that, at that um, email address. We, of course, also want to acknowledge the, the organizations that have supported our work without which this would not be possible. And um, the Cabin Aquatic Monitoring Network, of course, through Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Center for Biodiversity Genomics at University of Guelph Living Lakes Canada, World Wildlife Fund, and a, a variety of supportive suppliers as well in, in both Calgary and in uh, BC as well. They've also, they recognize that we are an organization that relies on grants and have really helped us financially to cut our costs. So we wanted to acknowledge that as well. We want to thank the volunteers, the cabin core team as it, as it became known. And uh, these people are mainly retired professionals who really just see that their time is really valuable when it's put towards these water monitoring program initiatives and um, who can blame them. It's, it's a beautiful place to be. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Reagan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Charlene. That was fantastic. Um, I'm always impressed by the Ghost Watershed Alliance Society and how motivated and ambitious they are. It's a huge undertaking um, for that many sites and doing DNA and morphological samples um, is quite time extensive. So I just wanna highlight that, but I'll invite all of the presenters to turn on their cameras and their um, microphones and we'll launch into the question and answer period. So um, yeah, please enter your questions in the Q&A function um, and we can start. So we have one question for Charlene. Uh, why did you choose to sample in the Wiper sub basin, basin in the first year? Thank you for that question. Uh, the team that selected those sites in the plan recognized that in the state of the watershed report, the sedimentation issue was the, um, the most pronounced in the Waper Subbasin. And so the, the land use activities combined with the geologic setting, so there's a rotable shales um, in, in some high canyon and cliff walls. And so it became sort of the perfect candidate to start off our, our water monitoring program. So that's why we chose the, the ghost or the Waper Subbasin over the ghost. And now this year we're focusing on the ghost. I hope that answers that question. Unmuted. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit more about the volunteers who help with the ghost watershed project? I think that one's for Charlene again. Oh, sure. Um, so there was four members that were originally trained in Canmore. And one of them went on to become the project manager, which was fantastic. Uh, I think I actually believe he is on the webinar today. Um, and he is a biologist by profession and ran the whole program along with his wife and did a fantastic job. But the volunteers that came and two of them were trained as well, uh, Cal and Bob, and were fantastic kick netters. They were, they were the staple crew to, to, to go through in the water with their, with their waders. And then on the shore, we often had um, re retired professionals who were on the board of directors. Uh, we recognize that there was a fair bit of training that actually needs to take place for that data to be collected properly, but we would like to include others in the community. And I, I watched Sophie and see the, the images of, of the community-based participation she had, and I think it's fantastic. And we, we would really like to do that as well with a little bit of training um, 
we talked about doing a mentoring, like a one-on-one, -on -one, here's how you do embeddedness, here's how you do slope, um, things like that. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great. I want to show this video to my dad so that he can be inspired <laughs> to start his own <laughs> biomonitoring program. Um, yeah, and big shout out to Brian and Marina. They've been so instrumental in getting the program started and yeah, they're great. Um, so during the field season, what are some of the challenges the ghost watershed faced? And um, it looks like we might have time for a minute. So maybe we could do like a quick round table for the, the monitoring challenges that um, each of you faced. So just quickly, and then I hope other people just jump in. The, the monitoring challenges we had was one access to the reference site. It's difficult to get to and you need specialized transportation. Um, the second was whirling disease. So the decontamination process was essentially doubled um, and, and Brian could speak more to that, but it was extremely time intensive for him and Anne. And, um, and COVID, you know, we had to make sure we were masking and making sure we had enough distance between us. And that was a challenge to others. I can jump in. I mean, I think our challenges were pretty much the same because we're also dealing with whirling disease and COVID, who isn't? Um, and also, I think for us, um, the travel time was a bit of a not it wasn't a challenge but it was it was significant so we would be we live in Lethbridge most our staff and we would be driving two or three plus hours to get to one site and oftentimes so we would only get to you know sample one or two sites in a day um, and these sites are you need to have good clearings with four-wheel drive to get to them because our a lot of ours are on public land as well and um so it, it just meant that we could only sample, you know, we were limited in how many sites we could do. And on occasion, what happened one time was we would, we left Lethbridge and everything was fine. And we got to our site in the mountains and it was pouring rain and our little creek was waist high raging river almost. So you never really quite know what you're going to get into, but that's, I think that's just goes for any kind of field work. And that's part of what makes it interesting too. Uh, unfortunately, because um, I've only been with the Elk River Alliance two months, uh, <laughs> I don't have any great answers to this question, but I'm assuming similar, <laughs> similar things to what everybody else is experiencing. I'll find out this year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have one more question from Anne. So for ever, all, the, all the panelists again, um, is it yearly fall cabin stream and how to get long-term funding? Yes, it's yearly in the fall. I'm, I'm not sure if the question is about the funding or the sampling. So our field season is in the fall, like uh, I think Charlene mentioned in kind of late August. We were able to sample last year until the beginning of November, just because of with a, a brief break for a snowstorm. Um, but it's in the fall so that it's I think the stream you can sample throughout the year though as long as you can access the water and it's open but for a cabin because they need the larger sizes of the insects they want them to be in the fall so that they you can send them to the taxonomist for proper id um how to get long-term funding is a great question and if anybody has the answer to that please fill me in um I think we're all in that boat of trying to I, trying to um, secure that long-term funding to make a larger project. And I think the collaborative is, is a really good approach to that because we are able to then tap into some larger sources of funding for bigger projects because we're working as a collaborative. It's not just piecemeal here and there. Anyone else wanna chime in on that? Yeah, um, for us, we also have a lot of challenges um, finding sustainable funding. Um, I think we're looking into some dedicated donors, but uh, most of our funders uh, like to donate to different things every year. Um, but yeah, we're we're hoping to work on that. Yeah, I would I would echo that. 
uh, you know, finding adequate grant funding is a constant challenge. And uh, Marina Craner, our executive director, spends a lot of her time uh, grant application, report writing, uh, follow up searching for more grants. We have applied for a multi year grant. Uh, and maybe that's the way forward. But um, I think it also helps to be part of an, a national network that grant funders see that this is connected to a larger purpose, that the database, uh, it, it, it's just a bigger, it's a bigger fish, I guess, would be another way to say it. Um, in terms of sampling, yes, Brian would know more of the specifics, but the cabin protocol and Reagan, you would know that September is typically more stable conditions in the aquatic environment. So uh, less uh, volume flow changes. Uh, usually the weather is more stable. And for all of those reasons, that's why the sampling is recommended to be in, in early fall. September snowstorms notwithstanding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, I would just like to echo you all and we're all working away at getting multi year funding, but I do want to say like a huge thank you to the rest of the stream team, including the World Wildlife Fund Canada, who helps us Living Lakes Canada um, support the trainings, um, the University of Guelph for everything you do, including the shipping of the um, samples and analysis and uh, support with reporting. Um, and Environment and Climate Change Canada um, for really just setting up this whole framework and these methods for us and supporting us where, wherever um, we need uh, as to do with the CABIN program. So um, I'll just pass it over to the panelists one more time before we wrap up and say the, the closing remarks. Um, is there any other comments or questions from anyone? I just want to jump in and say a huge thank you to Reagan and Living Lakes Canada because you have been like our stream champion and and just reflecting on that question about funding Reagan has put in countless hours taking the lead on applying for funding for our Eastern Slopes Collaborative and doing loads of meetings and answering questions but especially for the funding and the training support so thank you Reagan and Living Lakes Canada. Oh, you're gonna make, make me make me blush now I'm stuttering. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sophie. I appreciate that. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, thank you all for presenting your wonderful projects. Um, and hopefully we can feature you again um, next year. So thank you all the participants for your time and attention and tuning in to learn about the stream project and how it's been applied to in different water monitoring contexts. Um, again, thanks to all the speakers, Sophie, Kaylee, Charlene, and our sponsors, Alberta Ecotrust. We couldn't have done it without the support of funding. Um, so we really, really appreciate that, that support for all of our projects. Um, please join us for our fourth and last webinar, which will happen May 27th, and it will feature Indigenous lead water monitoring projects that have been collaborating um, with STREAM. We have participants from the Skeena and Northern BC, so it should be a really great webinar and really interesting. Um, and we'll follow up early next week with the webinar package um, for all the information and the resources that was mentioned throughout this webinar, as well as the recording um, and hopefully the slides from the presenters. Um, so with that, everyone, have a good day and thank you and see you May 27th. Bye.